Uh, good morning to one and all and welcome to worship on the 4th of July in the year of our Lord 2021. May the 4th be with you all day today. It also is the 6th Sunday after Pentecost on the Christian calendar and we welcome you to our last, we hope, virtual only broadcast of our uh, morning worship on Sunday. We are ready to reopen next Sunday on the 11th uh, at 11 a.m. And if you feel it is safe for you to be here, we invite you to be with us. Uh, and if not, uh, please tune in. This will be on line and there will be specifics uh, going out uh, later this week to help you tune in if you need to. So uh, if you are tuning in for the first time, welcome. We're glad you finally found us. And if you've been with us through these many months, we thank you for your patience and endurance. And we look forward perhaps to seeing you uh, here in our sanctuary in weeks to come. Let us now begin our worship with the responsive call to worship. Why do we come to worship God? We come seeking a blessing from the Lord. What is this blessing we seek? We seek an encounter with God who washes us in mercy, calls us to service, and fills us with love. Let us worship God together. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Trinity Presbyterian Church. We hope that this week you've looked around in your life and recognized God's love and God's glory and God's grace in your everyday things so that you feel that joy in your heart so that we can join together and sing his, his praises today. Join with me in our opening hymn, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies. <laughs> together using the corporate prayer of confession, the words of which are on your screen, followed by a moment of silent and individual confession. 
Let us pray together. You are love, O God, and you have loved us from the beginning. Forgive us when we do not share your love with others, when we choose selfishness over compassion, what feels comfortable rather than what is right, when we strive for success instead of faithfulness, when we value independence over community. Forgive us, O God, of the ways we fall short. Free us to try again and let your love lead the way. Hear our prayers, O Lord, both spoken and silent. In the name of Christ we pray, and let all God's people say, Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Do not doubt it. Hope does not disappoint us. For God's grace has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Believe this good news and give thanks. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. And let all God's people say, Amen. And now may the peace of Christ that passes all understanding be with you now and forever and also with you. Today's first scripture lesson is Psalm 48. Listen for the word of God. A song of the sons of Korah. The Lord is great. He should be praised in the city of our God on his holy mountain. It is high and beautiful. It brings joy to the whole world. Mount Zion is like the high mountains of the north. It is the city of the great king. God is within its palaces. He is known as its protection. Kings joined together and came together to attack the city. But when they saw it, they were amazed. They ran in fear. Fear took a hold of them. They hurt like a woman having a baby. You destroyed the large trading ships with an east wind. First we heard, and now he, we have seen, that God will always keep his city safe. It is the city of the Lord of heaven's armies, the city of our God. God, we come into your temple. Think we There we think about your love. God, your name is known everywhere. Everywhere on earth, people praise you. Your right hand is full of goodness. Mount Zion is happy. All the towns of Judah rejoice because your decisions are fair. Walk around Jerusalem and count its towers. Notice how strong they are. Look at the palaces. Then you will be able to tell your children about them. This God is our God forever and ever. He will guide us from now on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Welcome to the children's song for today. Do you like rules? I know your moms and dads probably give you lots of rules and probably most of them you're not real fond of. You must go to bed at nine o'clock. You must brush your teeth twice a day and for more than just 30 seconds. You must make your bed. You must help do the dishes. You must help in the lawn. You have to pick up the sticks, or even maybe if you're old enough, maybe mow the lawn. So we're not always real fond of rules. Even grown-ups aren't. And sometimes we try to think of ways to get around them because rules just aren't our favorite thing, um, especially in America, where we value liberty and freedom to do what we want to do. But you know what? Rules are important. Rules are very important. They help us maintain order and help us get along with one another. 
When you have rules in your classroom at school, it helps everybody get along and nobody gets their hurt, feelings hurt and, and the learning continues smoothly. When you follow the rules in your family, then you make mom and dad happy, you make your siblings happy, and ultimately that makes you happy. And in kind of the same way, Jesus gave us the most important rule of all. And you know it, it's called the golden rule. The golden rule is one that sounds easy, but it's not. Jesus told us to love everybody the same way that we love ourselves. And that is not always easy. Love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes we find that extremely hard to do. But you know what? If you follow that, if you follow that really hard rule to kind of, to, to kind of obey, that love comes back to you. The more love you give to the people around you, I promise, the more love will come back to you and your heart will feel better for it. I have a song about that this morning, and surprise, it's called Love One Another. Please listen. today is, don't you? The 4th of July. And we all know what that means uh, in America. It means hot dogs. It means fireworks. Uh, it means uh, wonderful musical concerts uh, on, on TV and just a lot of fun celebrating uh, our uh, separation from uh, Great Britain 245 years ago. Just think of all those brave patriots who, uh, who came along and, and helped us create this new nation. Uh, George Washington comes to mind. George and Martha Washington were great, uh, great leaders. Uh, John Adams and his wife, Abigail, they were great leaders from Massachusetts. Oh my gosh, speaking of Massachusetts, John Hancock and Samuel Adams and back down in Virginia was Thomas Jefferson who actually wrote the Declaration of Independence, although he wanted uh, Adams 
uh, to, to write it, but uh, he had to get home. <laughs> and so they persuaded uh, Jefferson to, uh, to write it, and he did, and produced a, a magnificent document. So we are going to celebrate what they did today. You know, we have a flag, and we always learned that the, in school to pledge our allegiance to the flag and the nation for which it stands. And that flag is red, white, and blue. It has 13 stripes on it, and what do they, what do they stand for, Izzy? You remember the 13 stripes, uh, the red and white? What do they stand for? Yeah, you remember it. He's been doing his homework. The original 13 colonies that were represented there on the 4th of July, 1776, who signed the document. Uh, what, are the, what about the, how many, so there were, how many stars were on the first flag? Well, there were 13. Each of those stars uh, stood for one of the original 13 colonies and they were in a circle. Uh, and it was on a field <coughs> of blue. So we have white stars on a blue field and 13 red and white uh, uh, stripes representing uh, those original 13 colonies. Now, uh, that, uh, who, who was, um, when we became a nation after they wrote the Constitution uh, 13 years later, uh, who was the first, the very first colony uh, to, uh, to ratify or approve uh, the Constitution? Do you know who that was? Uh, it was um, Delaware. Back in 1787, December the 7th, 1787. The second one in line was Pennsylvania, uh, just a few days later on December the 12th. Uh, do you know when North Carolina uh, ratified it? And that was on uh, the 12th, uh, they were number 12, on November the 21st, 1789. Now, how many stars do we have in, on the flag now? Izzy, you remember that part? Yeah, you're, you're good, you're good. Here, here's a dog biscuit. Uh, 50, I can remember when uh, Alaska and Hawaii came in. And I always forget the order. Uh, <clears throat> the, the last one was Hawaii. Alaska uh, beat them to the punch uh, as the number 49. But here's a really hard pop quiz. Which of the 50 states uh, joined the union before Alaska, which would have made them number 48. Yeah, 48. You know this one, Izzy? Oh, you don't know that one. Oh, that, you, you oh, okay. You fell asleep during that part in the, in the, okay, all right. Well, aren't you glad we're, we're all about grace around here? Well, it was Arizona. Uh, it came, became a state uh, in on, 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 get this, on um, Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 1912, they became the 48th state. And then uh, when Hawaii joined on August the 21st, 1959, I was nine years old, we had 50 stars uh, in the flag. And if we ever have another state, uh, we will have uh, to, to get a new flag and add an extra star to make it 51. So we give thanks to God today for the bravery, the courage, the commitment to God and country uh, back 245 years ago who helped the United States of America become a nation. So uh, let us join a pause here and thank God uh, for God's grace and for God's love. Let us pray together. Dear God, thank you for your grace and love Thank you for the brave men and women who signed the Declaration of Independence and helped create our nation long ago. We pray that you would make us responsible citizens who, in the words of Jesus, love one another. And let all God's people say, Amen. Thank you, Izzy. See you next week. God bless you. At the heart of the Christian gospel is the almost incredible fact that 
we have undergone a conversion from what we were to what God wants us to be, a transformation. Uh, Paul calls it a new life in Christ, a whole new creation. So this is captured beautifully in 2 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, uh, beginning with verse 16 and concluding with 21. Listen again for the word of God contained in this beautifully condensed statement of the gospel. Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I hope you're ready for uh, a great celebration today. The uh, 4th of July has become a, a very uh, salutary um, milestone in the history and in the life of America. Uh, it goes back uh, to, uh, to our uh, origin and story. Uh, we all know it well. And so, um, we're, we're even going to get a bunch of sunshine today and tomorrow uh, in this wonderful uh, weekend. Now, on July the 4th, 1976, I found myself in an unlikely place. I had recently moved to Boston for my first full-time job, fresh out of seminary, and I was delighted to discover that the city was celebrating the bicentennial of our nation, the signing of the Declaration of Independence in a big, big way. Now, for decades, the Boston Pops Orchestra had played a 4th of July concert on the lawn by the Charles River on a very long river work uh, they called the Esplanade. But this was the 200th anniversary of that signing, and so uh, this year's concert uh, or I should say that year's concert, was uh, planned to be something way over the top. Well, I certainly didn't want to miss this big event, so a friend and I arrived an hour and a half or so uh, early so we could get a good seat on the lawn. Well, the problem was uh, about one million other people had the same idea. You can look it up in the Guinness Book of World Records, and that event is listed as the largest outdoor classical concert in world history. I think it's still, I don't think that that record has been broken. I haven't checked, but uh, that, that was a new record. Well, after spending an hour and a half trying to find one little patch of ground to sit on, uh, we were forced to do what Zacchaeus did when Jesus came to town. We had to climb a tree, which was behind the, 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 the concert stage, which was a, a half shell, uh, a half shell, and opaque, you couldn't see any, any of the players, uh, and, and sit in that tree for the next two and a half hours, uh, listening to the Boston Pops give a rousing concert, uh, playing that climax with the William Tell Overture and the Stars and Stripes Forever with peeling church bells, breathtaking fireworks, and loud cannons filling the night sky. Oh, what a night 
to remember. I like to tell people I actually didn't see uh, the orchestra play at that concert, but I did hear them, uh, even though the uh, seating was less than uh, desirable. America had a lot to celebrate that night. The American experiment in democracy had held for 200 years, which surprised a lot of people around the world who had not expected it to do so and, and many who hoped it wouldn't. That was a heady time for a, a young Southern boy from Burlington, North Carolina, living a, a few blocks from Beacon Hill, that historic uh, mountain in Boston and working at a historic church where Benjamin Franklin was baptized and where Samuel Adams convened the Boston Tea Party from the pulpit of that sanctuary that lit the fuse of the Revolutionary War. Now, mind you, a lot of Americans are confused about the origins of our nation. While it is true that the first European settlers who came here in 1620 and 1630 were largely British Congregationalists who came here for religious freedom and social and economic opportunities that had been denied them uh, back home and were afforded only to the well-born. They did not establish a nation at the beginning. There were 13 different colonies, most of whom, interestingly, established a single Christian denomination as the official church within that colony, mostly Congregational and Anglican. In North Carolina, the Colonial Assembly established the Anglican Church as the official church of the colony. Now, this meant that Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and all other non-Anglicans could not call their houses of worship a church. Only the Anglican churches could do that. And so they were called meeting houses, which is a kind of a generic term and an insult if you uh, happen to be uh, uh, a non-Anglican. And uh, to add insult to injury, the assembly levied a tax on everybody to support the Anglican church, which included paying the salaries of the priests. Now don't you know that went over well with the Presbyterians and the others who, who left England to get away from all of that? They not only had to pay their tithes to their own churches, but they had to pay a tax to a church that they didn't belong to. So by 1775, a sizable number of Americans had had enough of the unfair, burdensome taxation without any representation. So they rose up in full rebellion against the policies of King George III and the British Parliament. And of course, as you know, this led to the Revolutionary War, and on July the 4th, 1776, delegates from all 13 of those colonies gathered in Philadelphia as the Continental Congress and adopted and signed the Declaration of Independence. William Hooper, John Penn, and Joseph Hughes signed it on behalf of North Carolina. Uh, Hooper's buried over in Hillsboro in the churchyard there at the Presbyterian Church. Uh, he, um, his, uh, the first pastor of that church was the Reverend John Witherspoon III, the grandson of the Reverend John Witherspoon I, who also signed that document for New Jersey, where he also happened to be the president of a small Presbyterian college uh, we now call Princeton. Presbyterians had a hand uh, in shaping the, uh, the origins of our nation. Now, what the Revolutionary War did was to enable the colonies to declare and to achieve their independence from British rule. But it did not create a nation until 13 years later when the Continental Congress wrote a constitution got, and got it ratified by all 13 colonies, which uh, finally happened in uh, 1789. And this is when the United States of America became a bona fide nation. And that constitution they wrote was a brilliant document because it not only established a democratic republic, a representative democracy with three branches of government for checks and balances with various authorities and responsibilities, but it also contained a bill of rights that guaranteed basic human freedoms for 
its citizens. So, on the 4th of July every year, we gather to celebrate our independence from Great Britain, but we should not forget that a constitution soon followed that created our government, a government of laws and institutions that protect our life, our liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I love the preamble to the Constitution, which sets forth the basic political philosophy behind the whole thing. You ready to hear it again? It never grows old. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Those are our founding words. Now, taken together, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, they are the twin foundational pillars on which our nation and our society rest. The first document actually achieved freedom from British tyranny, but the second one not only guaranteed some important basic human rights like freedom of religion, press, speech, peaceable assembly, but it also called for basic citizenship on the part of all citizens. Do you remember back in the day uh, when we used to get graded on citizenship in school? There was conduct and citizenship, and you didn't want to get a C on either one of those. A nation that just guarantees personal freedoms without requiring basic responsibilities of its citizens like paying taxes, obeying the laws, and voting in elections, and respecting the rights of others, this quickly devolves into chaos as history has shown. But one that understands the responsibility that comes with those freedoms, uh, they are, thanks be to God, still around. We see this same dichotomy in the Christian church, don't we? The Apostle Paul spent a lot of money on ink writing about this new freedom that God gives us in Jesus Christ. We are saved by God's grace. And Luther came along and said, by grace alone, and not by works or anything that we do. It is a 100% gift of generosity by God. We do not have to earn it by anything we do. This is the basic good news of the gospel. That's what that word means, good news. But that is not the whole story. God didn't create us just to be free and run around and do what we want to do without any moral or ethical restraints. No. Scripture clearly teaches that God created us for love, to love God and one another. So this new freedom God has so graciously given us in Christ does not mean that we are free to do as we please. It means that we are free to live a new kind of life, one characterized not by an obsession with our own needs and desires, but one focused on love of others. Some of you are old enough to remember uh, President John Kennedy's uh, inaugural speech uh, back in uh, well, I guess that would have been, uh, the election was in 60, so I guess that would have been in January of, of 61. He said, ask not what you, what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. That speech inspired a whole new generation to join the Peace Corps and to seek uh, lives of public service. In that same vein, the Apostle Paul told the Roman Christians not to use their new freedom in Christ as a license to do as they please, but as an opportunity to love and serve one another. He wrote, Owe no one anything except to love one another, or those who love their neighbor have fulfilled the law. For the whole law can be summed up in one sentence. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Paul's still more excellent way is writ large in our second lesson today. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. There's the grace. And entrusting the message of reconciliation to us, there's our responsibility to share it with others. The freedom from having to earn our salvation by keeping God's law gives us a new freedom for loving God and others. That's how it works. Transformation, conversion from the old to the new. That's what the Christian life is all about. And it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of, a lot of practice, a lot of uh, discipline, uh, frankly, a lot of years of doing the heavy lifting. So let us celebrate today uh, the 245th birthday uh, with a bang as we uh, raise a glass to our nation. Uh, we are not perfect. Uh, those rights and privileges uh, and freedoms were not afforded to everyone in the beginning. It took a lot of hard work uh, to get that done uh, through the years. Let us give thanks to God for the brave, selfless patriots who fought for our independence from British tyranny and then the wisdom to write a constitution that would protect our security our basic human rights, and promote the general welfare, the common good. And let us give thanks for the grace of God who has given us this whole new life in Christ, a life of liberation from the burden of sin and a life of liberation to a life full of uh, love, joy, and peace. Now, that is certainly something worth celebrating. Please pass the mustard and the fireworks. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift, even Jesus the Christ. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, sometimes we just simply do not understand this new freedom you have given us in Christ. At the end of the day, it is full of a new opportunity, an opportunity to become the people you created us to be, kind and loving, accepting, uh, sympathetic, and offering empathy toward those around us. So let us celebrate the birth of our nation today, but let us remember that it is not all about freedom alone but it is about the responsibility and the opportunity uh, to be your people in your world, to spread the good news throughout the world that God is love, and that love changes things, even us. In Christ's name we pray. And let all God's people say, Amen.
join me now in our affirmation of faith as we give testimony to what we believe. Uh, this affirmation today comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. Uh, let us say what we believe. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. We are taught to bring all things to God in prayer. We come through the boldness of our faith, of believing that God is a God of mercy and grace and steadfast love. And hears all our prayers and answers them according to God's wisdom and justice and goodness. So before we pray, I would share a few concerns with you. Uh, please keep uh, Dale Overcash and his family in your prayers. His mother, Rachel, who underwent surgery two weeks ago, uh, has taken a turn for the worse and is not expected to survive. So please keep uh, the Overcash family in your prayers in the next few days. Uh, Virginia has shown some improvement in the past week and has uh, been back in the office a bit uh, this week, so continue to pray for her as she uh, plans to undergo another round of infusion in a few weeks. Dorothy Denby Page is in rehab at Wake Med. She is improving and looking forward to getting home soon. And continue to remember Karen Loveland as she undergoes her treatment for cancer. Let us pray. We will be using uh, bidding prayers today when I say, we pray to you, O God, if you would please say, hear our prayer. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the needs of the church, the whole human family, and all the world, saying, we pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That churches of all traditions may discover their unity in Christ and exercise their gifts in service of all. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That the earth may be freed from war, famine, and disease, and the earth and soil and waters cleansed. O God, we pray to you, hear our prayer. That those who govern and maintain peace in every land may exercise their powers in obedience to your commands. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That you will strengthen our own nation to pursue just priorities so that the races may be reconciled, the young educated and the old cared for, the hungry filled and the homeless housed, and the sick comforted and healed. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That you will preserve all who live and work in this community in peace and in safety. We pray to you, O God, hear our prayer. That you will comfort and empower those who face any difficulty or trial, the sick, especially Virginia, Dorothy, Karen, and Rachel. The disabled, the poor, the oppressed, those who grieve, those who are in prison. We pray to you, O oh God, hear our prayer. We pray that you will accept our thanksgiving, O God, for all faithful servants of Christ now at rest, who with us await a new heaven and a new earth that you have promised. 
your everlasting kingdom. Merciful God, as a potter fashions a vessel from humble clay, you form us into a new creation. Shape us day by day through the cross of Christ, your Son, until we pray as continually as we breathe, and all our acts are prayer. Through Christ, who taught us all to pray with these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And let all God's people say, Amen. Jesus taught it is truly better to give than to receive, uh, although both giving and receiving is a part of God's blessings. So the session, I continue to be grateful to all of you for your generosity in the past several months of uh, continuing and your faithful stewardship, which has enabled us to continue our uh, programs of uh, worship and education and service. So we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your generosity. Let us go to God now in prayer, uh, asking God to bless these gifts and offerings uh, in the support of Christ's ministry. Let us pray. O loving and generous and gracious God, we give you thanks for all your good gifts, especially Jesus Christ and the new life you give us in him. We pray that you would bless these gifts and offerings, use them to continue Christ's ministry of reconciliation here in this congregation, in our community, and around the world. And let all God's people who love you through Christ say now, Amen. We close our worship on this holiday weekend celebrating the independence of our country with one of our favorites, God of the Ages, whose almighty hand. Join with me. God of the ages, whose almighty hand leads forth in beauty of the starry band of shining worlds in splendor through the skies.
the Declaration of Independence back in 1776. And thank you for uh, being a part of these virtual worships for the past 15 months. Today is our last one for now. And uh, we uh, hope and pray that uh, if you are uh, able to be with us uh, safely uh, next Sunday at 11, uh, that you will be here sitting in these uh, empty pews that have been empty for far uh, too long. But we will be uh, recording the service uh, that uh, will be posted later uh, in the day uh, on, on YouTube. And we'll send out details uh, later in the week. So go in peace now. Serve the Lord with gladness. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering, honoring all people everywhere, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.